Come on in. Sarah, take it away. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us all. I, I was actually going to ask our lovely panelists to introduce themselves, along with a, a couple fun facts. Um, the, the first of which, I guess if you have a film at the festival, if you could please identify it and plug it. Or if you don't, um, just a few words about kind of what sorts of films you're drawn to as producers and what your um, concept of a, of a producer is. Like what is your exact role in the process of shepherding a film from you know, concept to production or through production? So wait, do we only answer the second one if we don't have a film in the festival, or do we answer both of them? I think you, can talk, about, you can talk about what kind of films you are interested in making if you don't have a film okay. at the festival. So I have two films in the festival. The first one is called Cold November, which uh, just played at 1 o'clock today. It's about a 12-year-old girl being raised by women who's taken through the rite of passage of killing a deer for the first time. Uh, and then uh, there's a film that I directed that one and produced it. Uh, then there's a film called The Misogynists, which is directed by Owner Tickell, which played last night at 11.30. Was it last night? Might have been two nights ago. No, I think it was last night. Um, and uh, I, yeah, I produced that film. Uh, and films that I'm attracted to, I guess, are... Uh, I don't know. I like to be a little mischievous uh, with my films. I like to, I like to make people uncomfortable, but uh, not uh, do things that are gratuitous. Uh, I like subjects that are based in truth, uh, and um, I like folk tales, I guess, or tales of uh, coming of age, getting older. You know, yeah. I guess it's kind of general, but. I think the quality about the films that, that I work on that I like the most is that they push the audience uh, out of their comfort zone. So, yeah. And, and what do you, how do you understand your role as a producer in a given production? Oh, uh, I guess it varies by project, but um, uh, just trying to, you know, uh, get everything done that we need to get done in order for the project to be as good as it can with the resources that we can, or the resources that we have, and, you know, trying to, uh, you know, I'm not above cooking breakfast for people or doing a coffee run or, you know, whatever it takes just to get us to through to the bitter end. Um, yeah. Yeah, just making sure it all happens and following through, you know, don't, don't abandon a project just because uh, it seems like the um, challenges are insurmountable. Um, I'm Lucas Joaquin. Uh, I produced a movie called Love After Love that's here at the festival um, tomorrow, screening tomorrow at 1.30. Um, and uh, I've also produced uh, several films by Memphis's own Ira Sachs. And uh, the first film I ever worked on was a film called Forty Shades of Blue here in Memphis. Um, but uh, <laughs> and I haven't been back since, so I'm very excited to be back in Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, I, um, you know, I, I have a company called Secret Engine. Uh, we're a production company. We develop projects um, and uh, find financing for projects and then oversee their production. And uh, I'm drawn to films um, by original voices. You know, just, we're really, we just respond, whatever we respond to creatively, um, and, you know, we, we, we take on. It's, it's as simple as that. And uh, as far as what a producer does, I mean, it's true. It's, on every project, it's, it's really different. But, um, we, we like to take on projects at the kind of early stages, develop them creatively with writers or a writer-director, um, and because uh, through that process we're really able to kind of create shared goals with the filmmaker that then carry through into the film production process and into the ultimate selling of the film to a distributor and all of those conversations about marketing and distribution and et cetera. So. Uh, hey, it's on, it's on. Um, my name is Madeline Molyneux. I'm a um, creative producer based in New York and Los Angeles. And um, a film that I produced uh, called Tonsler Park screen this morning. Um, I tend to work with um, filmmakers who I sort of 
get out of the way, um, I would say. I, I know that I'm going to be able to kind of trust that they're going to make something that I will respond to and that, um, and that they um, have not compromised to much of an extent to actually make the film. Um, I work with a lot of filmmakers who straddle the art world. So uh, I was just in the UK, and, and they actually have a name for that of calling it artist moving image. Um, I think in the States, we tend to think of it as the black hole of art film, um, which differs from art house film. Um, but uh, here at the festival, the film I produced, which I should mention is by an artist filmmaker named Kevin Jerome Everson, um, is in a section, I believe it's called Departures. And, um, and, and it's, it, all the films in there, I think, share a certain sort of audacity and, and kind of a, I guess I would say a purity a vision. Um, and I have that sort of life. And then I also produce narrative uh, fiction filmmakers with actors with budgets that range from a million to 10 million. And I tend to go back into my art hole after I do a few of those because they can be a bit soul sucking. Um, I think the role of the producer is very varied. I get the feeling from all of us that we probably tend to identify more as creative producers, meaning kind of soup to nuts and having more of a stake in um, wanting to develop um, a filmmaker's vision. So I guess more on an auteur level of someone that writes and directs. Um, but, but basically, yeah, the, the films that I, that I look for, um, it's, it's mostly about the relation to the filmmaker. That's very important to me. Um, and also films that I can't easily categorize. So. Uh, so I just want to start kind of with a general question. I think now we're all well aware that we live in an age of the streaming giants like Netflix and Amazon and that, you know, the traditional distribution structure of your film being in theaters for a couple of months if you were lucky and then hitting the shelves at Blockbuster is now sort of um, esoteric. Uh, but if you guys can each, you all have been doing this for, for a while and so if if we can begin kind of by you talking about what you've felt the, the biggest changes and disruptions have been um, in, in working and, and selling and distributing films in this new environment. I mean, I, I feel like things are changing so rapidly that it's uh, even month to month things are getting crazy. You know, it was only a couple months ago that Facebook just committed a a billion dollars toward creating new content. Um, I think from a creative spec uh, perspective, the thing that I've noticed and sort of have la latched onto as being a, a positive thing that's changed is when you uh, are having trouble getting a film off the ground that's um, sort of a passion project that, that will probably, you know, uh, get eyeballs on it but doesn't have the ability to attract stars for one reason or another. Um, that companies like Netflix and Amazon are taking a chance on films, you know, whether or not you're able to attach big stars to it if they're, if they're happy with, with uh, the script and the content that you provide them. So it's not necessarily easier to get things greenlit, but it's, it's a, uh, it, we're living in a world now where it seems like you can have a little more creative sway than you could five years ago with your projects as a result of the disruptions from the big uh, streaming companies. Yeah, um, I agree. I mean, it's, it has been like a series of changes. Like when I really I started working uh, in film, it was for a production company called Parts and Labor. And uh, it was in 2007, right around the, right before the financial collapse. And right when the, the collapse of the um, DVD market was happening. And so you had a lot of, we were coming out of the, the 90s when the, the kind of, there were a lot of um, these mini majors and kind of mid, mid budget level movies being made that were um, propped up by this DVD market. And once that fell apart, um, there was a real hole in, in how to finance movies because nobody, <clears throat> nobody, you didn't have this backstop anymore. And so I feel like it's only been recently that like with the advent of um, Netflix having these worldwide deals and Amazon um, taking on theatrical and all this stuff, that really uh, people, there, there is a, you know, you see a, a new model. There's definitely a new model that, that allows people to um, 
you know, that, that allows uh, for financing for movies. Uh, it, for, uh, in those years between like, probably like 2008 and 2011 or 12, um, there just were no, like there were very few revenue streams. And now that there is, and there's, there's just more money in the business, which is good, you yeah. know, yeah. so. I mean, the, the issue of streaming is, I was saying it's, it was kind of an opportune um, ask to be on this panel because I've, it's not so much that I have, it's not being opposed to something, but I tend to work with filmmakers who, if I'm going to, if they're sort of coming from an art context, <clears throat> they're very much thinking about kind of the, the context of how their film is presented. So I've had this conversation um, with filmmakers about putting things on what I call more curated streams. I don't know how many of you are familiar with, let's say, MUBI, um, which is to me a very like curatorially driven, critic driven streaming platform that streams films for like a 30 day period, uh, but it tends to focus on filmmakers. And that's very different, let's say, from a Netflix or um, an Amazon or, um, I don't know, there's, I, guess, I think there's, there's different kind of models of streaming that tend to be either more viewer and, and con either viewer oriented or content oriented. Um, and I know we can all say that watching kind of the major streaming platforms, you miss films all the time. It's overwhelming. I mean, I would imagine with a film like that you guys have, you, you, it's going to get lost unless someone tells you to watch it. Whereas I, I do feel very strongly about these kind of curated platform and curated streaming platforms that basically say we're going to introduce you to one particular artist, um, one particular genre. Filmstruck and Criterion are also doing it as well. Um, anyways, it, it came up with a film that I did recently um, and the filmmaker basically s thought that it was the wrong platform, that they felt very strongly they wanted the film to be seen in a theater, shared with other people. I tried to explain, well, you can share it in your living room. It's not. It's not just down to the TV. But I understood. I understood the. I understood the resistance because it does. It, it puts it in a different kind of space. Um, so I think, for me, streaming is very interesting because I think it can be part of your overall strategy. You know, whether you're showing it in in festivals, in community screenings, in theater. And I'm talking about films that may not have this robust distribution life. You know, you may not have a distributor knocking down your door, it may be incumbent upon you to put it up on a platform, so, yeah. Yeah, I, I mean, and in addition to Mubi, it, there's almost like a streaming site now for every genre. Mm -hmm. You know, there's this one called Shudder, which does most, it's like Netflix for horror films, and there's also Fandor, which is a more indie niche kind of Netflix, I guess, if you're unfamiliar with it, you should check it out. But you both, Lucas and Madeline, kind of touched on how this affects distribution strategy. And uh, I mean, you guys will tell me, obviously, but in the past, we, when you're working on, on financing and, de and delivery of a film, you're kind of crossing your fingers saying, God, I hope this gets picked up at a festival. Otherwise, you're going to have to self-release it or put it out in theaters. And now, what does it look like when are you able to approach you know, investors early on in the process and say, we have this plan that's nailed down, we're going to get it on XYZ SVOD site and you will get a return as a result of that. Well, I think that's the other thing that's changed a huge amount is that um, <clears throat> a, a, a huge part of the way you finance independent movies is by, um, or has been traditionally by casting, by bringing on cast that can command a certain value on the foreign sales market. So bringing on a foreign sales partner early, having them give you estimates for how much they think you're gonna be able to sell your movie for or in territories around the world. And in that way, if you, you, know, you work with the agencies to cast somebody who has that certain value that you can hopefully say like, hey look, uh, however this film turns out, you know, because it's always a gamble for investors, however it turns out, we're gonna be able to make X amount back on the foreign sales market. Now those numbers, obviously aren't always correct, but that's, that's, that's what they've kind of, that's what we've kind of used as collateral for the past pr several years. And now that's changing with Netflix and with these worldwide deals, because Netflix now makes these deals throughout the world. So you, they take every single territory in the world. So that pretty much invalidates any of these, any of the foreign sales you're gonna make, right? So that's difficult that throws off the kind of goalposts for how we've been able to finance movies, but at the same time, it's kind of liberating because you do have players who aren't as tied, who aren't as bound to cast, or they're like Netflix, who's 
you know, they definitely, when you're working on them with a film with an original production or with an acquisition, they care about cast, but it's in a different way than the foreign sales value. Sometimes it's like, are these, are these actors part of movies or shows that have been successful on Netflix, or are they known in some other way, or, you know, so um, it's kind of, it's, it's simultaneously kind of difficult for for people because they have to figure out how to work in a different in, in this different model but also um, it can be quite liberating and it and it so yeah it's been it's been interesting to kind of work through that I think it's also given um, it's a it's just another component and I think it's also given people a lot of um, in a way, a little bit more hope when you, let's say, come out of a festival and it used to be traditionally that if, let's say, anywhere from five to eight of the distributors that you wanted to distribute your work would say no, you would just be left with basically, it could be a festival darling, it might have played Indie Memphis and maybe 10 other, 20 other festivals uh, in the country, but where else are you going with it? Or perhaps it never makes it into a festival, uh, but you still have this opportunity to present it to, to you know, a, a platform. Um, that streams content. So I do feel like it's it's changed also the way that people think about the future of their films. So that goes into like when you're thinking about actually putting a you know financing strategy together. Um, I don't think you still have that sense of hopelessness that a lot of filmmakers have. That not only will investors not see a return, but let's say you end up putting all of your sweat equity or savings into a film, um, there'll be something coming back. That said, I've licensed films to uh, streaming platforms and have gotten checks over like a three year period for like a dollar forty seven, which I just found incredibly insulting. It's like, don't even send me the piece of paper with the check. Um, and But that's balanced against what you can get, which is, and again, tell us if we need to kind of delineate terms, but um, you know, there is a way to ask for like an advance or a minimum guarantee on, on films that you sell um, for streaming that I think is a really, I always tell people to try to do it if you can, because it's very rare you're maybe going to see some money back on that a possibility. So. Yeah, does everyone know what SVOD is? We threw that out, and I was wondering. SVOD. S SVOD. <laughs> subscription VOD. It's a service like Netflix where you pay a subscription. Yeah. And then there's what? TVOD, right? Transactional VOD. And, and AVOD. What's AVOD? I don't know. I just heard what's that. AVOD? Anya, what's AVOD? Anya, what's AVOD? Advertising. Thank you. Oh, okay. Thank right. you, <laughs> audience member. Um, well, you know, we do, or at least I do, I think we throw Netflix and Amazon in the same sentence, but they have very different distribution strategies if, if they are, in fact, acquiring your film. Um, Netflix does day and date, which means they will throw it up online the same day they put it out in theaters, and Amazon typically does a, a window of, I don't know, how long it is, but maybe a month or so. Um, they'll do they'll do like sixty to ninety days. They'll do a thea traditional theatrical. I mean, right. depending. Yeah. Um, so I guess my question about that is net. You know, this this is my deduction, but basically it seems like Netflix doesn't see as much value in a theatrical release as as a company like Amazon does. Um, for you all, with with the resources that are presented online and in these streaming platforms, do you feel like there's still the financial incentive to do a theatrical release, or is it yeah, a definitely. money suck? No, definitely. I think for sure. And I think that when they... I think that Nef, whatever, I, whatever Netflix's strategy is, and I don't quite know what it is, I think it's just to to create a library of like endless content, um, but it does, I feel like it does ignore the theatrical component, which is still tremendously valuable because you see, uh, you know, you see a lot, you see some of these films that come out on Netflix only, right? And, and they don't always do a day and date release. They, they get to choose. If they want to do a day and date release, they do a day and date release at their theater chain that they own called IPIC, which has a theater in the financial district in New York and one in Glendale, Los Angeles. And they'll do it, and it's like basically for just like a um, qualifying run, but um, you and know, by qualifying you mean Oscar, right? Yeah, 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 yeah. An Oscar qualifying run, or just to get a um, an advert, you know, uh, just to get reviews. But with a with a traditional theatrical release, 
you can build, you, it, the, the infrastructure is still there to build a conversation around a movie, um, to market a film, to have people talk about it, to have reviews, and to, to build it slowly. Um, you know, in, in ways that I don't, I don't see happening with Netflix. Even with like a movie um, like the Meyerowitz stories, the Noah Baumbach movie, which I thought was really good. I, I, I saw it on Netflix, but I feel like it, it hasn't been as, part, as, as, and this is kind of anecdotal, but it feels like it hasn't been as part of the conversation as it would have been if it had a more robust theatrical um, release, you know. I mean, we're, we're doing the same thing with Cold November right now. I'm working with Visit Films and Monument Releasing, and, and they, they've put a lot of value in our theatrical as being a way to advertise the inevitable VOD releases. So, um, and doing eventized screenings so that momentum through social media just drives more people to the VOD. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I always say I'm like at the end of the, the marginal scale, but um, I guess I just keep coming back to the fact that it's percentage. I mean, the percentage of films that get made, even the ones that end up at festivals that actually have a theatrical run, because to actually do a theatrical run, um, the amount that you have to put in for for um, you know P and A and all sorts of sort of even if it's grassroots campaigning is huge. And so I always feel like we we still talk about theatrical runs like it's a possibility, but it's it's even when I've had films that a distributor has acquired, it's always a fight to what kind of theatrical run they're going to do. I mean, I just came off a documentary that, I've, uh, you know, of all the documentaries that I've produced over the years, it's going to end up being the most successful, it's being nominated for awards, um, and I feel like the success of it was because of critics seeing it in Los Angeles and New York and promoting it, but we were holding our breath that it would only last a week in these places, and then it, it grew and it grew and it ended up being distributed by um, Kino Lorber in like 50 cities. Um, but I feel, again, I, there's the part of me that always feels like it's a fluke, so I almost feel like part of what streaming is doing is changing that conversation that as important as theatrical is, where are the venues that are allowing this to happen, right? I mean, if there's whatever. I don't know how many features are at this festival. Like 90, maybe? So how many will end up doing theatrical runs, I guess? So. Yeah. No, I Not mean... To be negative, but... Yeah, no, no, no. I totally agree. And there are some films... Yeah, I mean, if you... Like, it, there are some films that... It, each film is different. And there are some films that, like, can still succeed on the kind of... In, in this theatrical world. Like, Love After Love, the film that we have here, IFC is putting it out theatrically in early 2018 in March. And I feel like they recognize that it's, it's crucial for the film to, to open this way, to have this conversation. That said, I think that if they, if they if, like we trust them, and if they said to us like, hey look, uh, we actually don't think this is the right plan, mm -hmm. and you only want a theatrical, we think that you only want a theatrical release out of vanity or something like that. Like you have to sort of, you do have to question, you have to interrogate yourself and say like, do I want this theatrical re release just because I want to validate the film and that's, that's how I understand like, the success of a film? Or um, is it actually, uh, like, actually going to be beneficial to the, to, the, to the actual release? And so I think e e it's true. You can look at something and it's like, actually, no. The, so, uh, cer certain films, they might very, very well succeed on a streaming mm -hmm. site and you might be able to market them in, in a really innovative way. And, and also, Theatrical movies that succeed, uh, or that that succeeded with the, the tr traditional theatrical model, like they're still the 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 lion's share of the revenue is still going to come out of streaming, mm -hmm. almost inevitably. You know, there's no doubt about it, and that's that's still the biggest part of how you're um, making money uh, on distribution. I wanted to ask you. No, I just want to ask because I, 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 this is a question I keep wondering about. I mean, there was a lot of sort of like noise um, a few years ago about the fact that that um, SVOD, VOD, numbers weren't being reported by distributors and so filmmakers never saw that return. I mean, if even if you have a 50-50 split or, you know, whatever, 30-70, 60-40, you wouldn't see that. And I wonder if that's changed because there's been such a hyper-awareness of the fact that, like, those numbers just don't get reported. Nope. Has it? Ne Netflix know. is I not being transparent with the numbers, yeah. right? No, they, they, don't, they don't release their numbers. And, and yeah, it's it's odd. Uh, internally, they're available to all the or they're. I know in, obviously, like internally, everybody can in the company can look at them. I don't know if everybody, but 
Uh, do you, do you have awesome. a secret uh, back door to no, the I've Netflix just, I've, numbers? No, I've spoken to folks that have worked there, and they're like, yeah, when, when, you, when you, will, you know, look into those numbers, man, and see what America is watching or see what the world is watching, it's pretty weird. <laughs> and you, you can tell, like, when they stop watching a given <laughs> episode or something or, like, how many times they watch the sex scene. Um, Have you but, seen the numbers? <laughs> huh? Have you seen the Netflix numbers? No. No. I wouldn't tell you if I had that. <laughs> um, I want to go back to what Lucas said, though, about... Um, Basically, I think for a lot of filmmakers, like theatrical runs still hold this cachet of, you know, I've made it. Um, but you mentioned, you know, is it worth it for this film to have a theatrical run? Does it, what, what's some of the criteria, I guess, that for you as a producer, you would push for a film to have a theatrical? I think uh, a lot of films, okay, so like the strategy mostly for these independent films is like, especially U.S. independent films, is you're going to bring it to a festival, probably Sundance, and get as much critical acclaim as you can and then sell it um, on, the, on, on that wave of positivity, right? And so if that's the case, if, if, if all of that works out, or, you know, then um, in order to capitalize, that, the, the movies, still, movies like that still need those reviews to kind of propel them forward. So um, a movie like Ira Sachs's Little Men, for instance, we opened it at Sundance uh, in uh, 2016, and um, Magnolia distributed it, and it got really great. It was probably one of the best reviewed films at the festival, and it just felt like not to give it a theatrical release wouldn't make sense because it still needed that word of mouth to succeed. It's still, and we knew with those, I mean, you never know, you know, but it's like with those reviews in hand, we could say like, all right, if we release it in these theaters, it's probably going to, people are going to pay attention, blah, blah, blah. You know, I mean, that's a special case because Ira is also like very highly regarded. And so we, we kind of know that the newspapers are going to pay attention. Um, but, uh, but, you know, Love After Love is a, is a, um, uh, you know, a similar case, I think. It was like, it, we opened it at Tribeca. It got great reviews. It has, it's, um, Andy McDowell is in it, and she gives a great performance, which was kind of universally recognized by people who saw it as a, um, a standout performance. And Russell Harbaugh was uh, the writer-director, and, you know, he was heralded as a new voice. So it's, you look at that and say, okay, um, we can still get people talking, and we can still we can get this this movie. In or it, it it succeeds on on those reviews and and that word of mouth. And so, to um, not to go that route would be, wouldn't be the right way. It feels like. And movies with built-in audiences, you know, issues, issue docs, and or, you know, um, well, like Cold November, for example. Like we, it's not necessarily an issue. Well, I don't know. I'm not sure what it is, but um, it definitely has. You know the the uh, resonance with sort of the gun debate people, and uh, you know uh, it, it doesn't really take a side in terms of like uh, you know red state blue state with uh, with the gun issue, but it seems to really resonate with people in a way that made us uh, approach a theatrical that um, is more eventized. You know, getting getting organizations to sort of rally around the movie and invite their you know constituents out to see it. So, I think that's another model for doing a theatrical. Yeah, and I think also theatrical now is taken on. Um, it just has a different sort of cast to it because there's micro cinemas. There's um, there's people actually in a way it's that DIY approach to theatrical that you saw people do sort of with with you know punk and alternative music and, and, and it would be nice if that sort of that wave, you could ride that wave and, and say well even if the traditional theaters or the theater chains or you know independent art house cinemas which apparently in Memphis I was talking to someone earlier and as much as I thought oh this is great you have all these theaters, those theaters tend to show the same sort of you know, many major distributors, or they'll maybe put Thor with an award-winning doc. But what is it? What about if you have this kind of indie film that's you know slipping, you know, through the cracks? So I feel like there's ways to kind of um, exploit, you know, the rise of micro cinemas, of like single screenings. I do a lot of things with museums and um, sort of cinematheques, and I think there's ways to extend that into a mini run, um, and again get the reviews and you know. 
all that kind of stuff. Yeah, I do think I, I, I do think that this. I, I don't know how, what you'd call it. I mean, I do feel like these sites which are curated are really important because I think they also give awareness to whether it's the filmmaker or the type of film that's being made. And so. Yeah, I think in, it seems like in 10 years from now, cable television is going to be replaced by a similar kind of idea with all streaming services and you're just going to be paying a la carte for the styles of things that you like to see in each company. I mean, Netflix is doing it. Netflix is stripping their library. I mean, they obviously have some kind of curatorial agenda. I'm not sure what it is yet, but they're doing something, right? Yeah, but then they're, they're also like, they are stripping it, but then they're also like, they're financing production and when they finance production, they own it in perpetuity forever, and they never have to share any profits or anything. So, right. it, it so yeah. <laughs> it's just like HBO. It started as home box office, and now it's right. largely original content. Yeah, true, and it, yeah. and it's it's interesting because it's a it's a similar model as HBO, which is like which is can be good creatively, which is that they don't they're not tied in that way. They're not tied to revenue. They're they're because they have subscription based revenue they're able to say they're able to it, the 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 movies that they the movies and television content that they finance is um, purely based on quality or what they think will mm. raise the quality of the brand yeah right i think the difference between hbo and netflix though is that hbo isn't what like 2 billion dollars in debt right now <laughs> which is something that's going to be interesting to see play out it's like I get the variety headlines in my inbox, and it seems like every month there's a, another one that's like, oh, Netflix just borrowed another $100 million. <laughs> so I wonder, I'm not sure what the plan is there. I'm not a business guy, so. <laughs> well, this is like part two of the theatrical question, but even if your film is accepted and it's on Netflix, uh, and you know the algorithms aren't necessarily in its favor, how do you go about making your film pop on these sites and ensuring that people watch it? Yeah, that I don't know. I, like, I, I mean, you, you know, because they they don't they for the most part don't engage in marketing in the same way as a traditional distributor. Um, so, and they largely rely on their homepage, like with the idea that like, and, and this isn't totally true across the board, but it's like, they're like, look, we have our homepage with however million sets of eyes on it, and that's all we need is to show it to somebody, and, and that, you know, we don't need to market things widely. That said, I have seen, you know, they've got a page in Variety saying like, um, hey, check out the, I, I, it might have been in the Times, uh, the New York Times, saying like, hey, here are the films that, from Sundance that were Netflix originals, like five different films. So that was marketing, but it's not, it's just, it's not, you know, it's not the That's traditional industry way of doing marketing. Things. Does that translate to consumer marketing? Right. Well, I think it was. I think it was in the New York Times. I have to. Ah, whatever. I'd have to look back at it. But it's true. And you see, they did. They did um, this movie, The Discovery, and they advertised all over. At least in New York, they had it on like bus station ad. Uh, the sides, you know. But uh, yeah. But it's it's difficult. Um, the films that I've produced that have been on Netflix, it is it is difficult to kind of. Once it's released on Netflix, try to shape a, as a producer shape a conversation around it. You know, without the resources of a traditional distributor devoted to marketing. Do you guys, as a production company, have a consumer-facing uh, like uh, email thing? Um, <laughs> we don't. <laughs> we don't. But it's an interesting idea. Yeah. Sincerely, I. I mean, it seems like the way to go. I mean, I, I made a film called Polywogs three years ago, and when I was you know, working on the infrastructure for both both social infrastructure and email infrastructure for Cold November, I was like, well, I'm just gonna I'm just gonna fold that crowd into you know Polywog's films and just sort of rebranded the original film title because I realized how valuable it is to have this direct marketing opportunity with your audience as a production company, mm -hmm. especially for things like when your Netflix release happens and you're not on the front page. How do you get people to watch the movie? Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I think it's really smart and it's. Uh, yeah, because the only other, yeah, the only other alternative is like social media, which is useful certainly, but and, and hats. Yeah. <laughs> you it's also need to have hats if you want people to watch your Netflix. <laughs> bright show. orange hats. Yeah. It's interesting you um no, you're mentioning uh, this with a production company, and again, I'm sorry, I, I feel like I'm in that like, you know, I have to keep name checking the topic, <laughs> so I keep mentioning streaming, but. Um, 
one thing that I think is really interesting is there's a few distributors, and I'll just shout out to one of them that I think is doing a really interesting job, which is Grasshopper Film, um, and they're tending not to do theatrical, but they're doing um, essentially um, very robust non-theatrical, like educational, limited screenings, but um, they have a blog, and within that blog is a streaming service. So a lot of films which they have acquired, which are tend to be more kind of um, art-driven, and they've been at major festivals like Cannes and Venice and Sundance, but um, they're definitely more challenging films. Within their blog, they actually are streaming the films, and it's non-exclusive. So the idea is that you as a distributor would create this kind of platform for your own films, and I'm starting to wonder if that's just going to start happening with production companies and with filmmakers, where if you don't have to be exclusive with a streaming service, you can take that into your own hands. It's like selling DVDs on your site, right? right, right. So, um, but since, at a certain yeah. point, don't you think consumers are going to get really exhausted of keeping track of all the different production companies out there? <laughs> I mean, well, film buffs is one thing, but like a general consumer, I feel like you're putting a lot of faith in them to keep track of this True. inevitable future. True, but not every, I mean, that's the other thing, is that it used to be that if you, even if it was a very small distributor, if you got that distributor, you knew your film was going to end up on, an, on, on a Netflix, let's say, or an Amazon. That's not even true anymore. You can still sell your film, and they don't have, um, I guess, output deals with the streaming services anymore. So I'm just thinking that there, there has to be some sort of way, and again, I'm always looking at the films that are going to fall through the cracks, because as maybe other people in this room have had, you know, you know the value of the great films you've produced or even seen that you wonder whatever happened to those. So I'm always interested in that. Um, I'm, oh, sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Are you done? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> sorry, I didn't mean like that. Um, one last question for the panel, and then I want to open it up to the audience. But you're seeing nowadays more and more uh, digital media companies like First Look, which has started this online platform called Topic. Um, you know, BuzzFeed is getting into short form videos. I was speaking with a, a woman recently who, who runs like an, an independent nonprofit in New York, and she thinks that like this is the new independent film. Like mm -hmm. everyone wants to be making three to five minute series on the web because that's, you know, what the internet has done to our attention spans. Um, it's a terrifying but, future. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that, that's where a lot of the money is right now and I'm, I'm just interested in, in all of your thoughts on that and, and whether that's something that you're interested in pursuing or creating work for or you want nothing to do with it. <laughs> I want nothing to do with it personally. Um, I mean, if I had something to do with it, I would want to sort of hack it or game it to get people's attention spans to slow down. You know, I would look at the whole thing as a meta art project, probably. <laughs> I, I have been involved in things like this. Oh. <laughs> no, I think it's interesting. Well, it's interesting, like, First Look is interesting as a company because it's true. They're doing that, but they're also doing television. They're also doing film, right? With the idea that, you know... I mean, it's, it is, it's an interesting trend, which is you have these companies treating kind of all content the same, which it, it, mm. to me is a little bit anathema because I'm a, I'm a film buff and I love the feature film format, but I also, you kind of can't deny um, the way things are moving and the way, thing, the way that people are um, watching uh, movies and television. So, I mean, the interesting thing about fil First Look is that they do, and Topic, is that they, they are doing this short form stuff, but they're, they're, they're looking at ways to do short form work and uh, kind of build relationships with filmmakers that, that can then go into either television series or films. So um, it's interesting, and I, I, you know, we are working with a filmmaker um, who, who maybe, you know, we're possibly developing something with them that is like a short form series. And it's a good opportunity for this filmmaker to get his work seen and then hopefully to transition that into something else. And so we're, we're kind of embracing it, you know? Mm. That's probably smarter than my approach. <laughs> but I understand, I also understand, I understand like I, I still like, I am very much a fan of like going to the movies and watching a movie or, you know, watching a, watching a feature on a streaming, even if it's streamed, you know, watching features, so anyway. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting to bring up shorts because I think that it's, it's, a, it's a form that everybody wants to 
get behind, but it's very malign because how are you going to actually program that and show, you know, you'd have to show a whole sort of series of them in theaters for it to kind of work. I think, I mean, I'm not Which really... Which they're also doing. There's these, yeah. some of these companies they're had shorts at Sundance mm -hmm. this year. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't I mean, to me, it's like, it, you know, it's like art. It's like, it's as long as it's going to take as long as the maker needs it to be and so I feel like it used to be or not it probably maybe still is that short films were a calling card and you could see calling card shorts and what it meant for feature but you know I was talking with um, I think I saw Mike Ryan wander in here I'm not sure if he's still here but um, a filmmaker named Jake Mahaffey who made Free Indeed that was shot in Memphis um, a short that Jake made um, you know they developed into a feature and so just having that short um, you know, I have no doubt that they made that short in and of itself, but knowing that the short was there, they could develop a feature out of it. So I feel like, oh, there you are, sorry, I'm looking all around for you. So I, I do feel like shorts are really, it's so cliche to say, but it really is as long as it takes, and so that gets more people to watch your work than... I think, yeah, yeah I think it's exciting for filmmakers because it's much more Im immediate um, than the long and very arduous process of developing a feature, but you still feel like you're getting your work seen, and yeah. maybe it's a building block. So, well, and and the, and one other interesting thing about that too is that like you do kind of have a company who is both financing and distributing content, you know, which is also where I think things are uh, tending. Like you see a lot of consolidation, and, and like in first look, and even in like you know WME in the agency world, you have this new uh, endeavor. Um, project and I'm not sure of the specifics of it but there it's it's almost like a studio within the agency so you have you have a lot of consolidation in these ways that I don't think we're really going to understand for um, the next um, you know the next few years um, for better or worse really yeah. I mean this this is we're kind of going back to the old studio system yeah. we're coming full circle and I don't know I'll be happy to see the other end of whatever's happening right now personally so yeah, I mean, that's a whole other conversation that's <laughs> off topic. <laughs> it's like, hopefully, I look at it and I'm like, okay, hopefully, if that means more money flowing to filmmakers to make their films, hopefully, that's a good thing, you know? Yeah. Um, but it is, yeah, it's a little troubling. And, and who knows, yeah, who knows what's going to happen with it? Well, I think it's mostly troubling because, you know, the projects that I've seen that are following this kind of model aren't necessarily the most creative or uplifting or forward thinking or groundbreaking. They're just sort of mechanized, you know, widgets of movies that are not really, I, I think it's stifling, you know, w what should be happening or what's more interesting to me, which is that, you know, Netflix just greenlit uh, a colleague of mine's film that he couldn't get off the ground anywhere else because it's all you know 12 and 13 year olds in the movie and they, he couldn't cast any stars right, right. you know that's that that to me is a little bit more fascinating than that consolidation but you know we'll see how it goes I mean, we got to do what we got to do too right um, oh sorry <laughs> oh hello sir. on that note uh, I want to open it up to the audience if y'all have any questions. No? We covered everything. All right, related that concludes our panel. <laughs> oh, sorry, we have one? <laughs> oh, oh, please, down in front. Yeah, I'm curious. Oh, sorry. Russ, Russ, come to the mic. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> oh. You must oh, approach God. the microphone. Can you talk about this Amazon deal where they pay you a bottom line? Like, isn't there some deal right now where they did they say have this much money, no that, matter what? That they were doing at Toronto. Yeah, they did it at yeah. Sundance too. One of them did it at Sundance. Any film that was in. I'm just curious. Talk about. You that. mean that? You mean licensing? The, you licensing the film. Well, that's what they were doing at Toronto. If you were in a certain um, competitive section, they would license it for X amount for global rights. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sight, and, a, yeah. sight unseen, though, which is the They would do it part. sight unseen, but for instance, I had a film that was in the experimental section called Wavelengths, and they just didn't even pay attention to that section, so I felt like it was just perpetuating it. But yeah, I don't know. I don't know how I think about it. So what he's talking about is, at, well, I heard about it at South by Southwest. It was any film, was it any film that got in or any film that was in competition? Competitive. Any series, film that was yeah. in competition, sight unseen, meaning they didn't need to watch the movie. It's just if you were in competition at South by Southwest and had the stamp of approval, they give you what, $50,000? 
I think that's what it was. I know they, yeah. they, yeah, it was at Sundance last year. And For what? I didn't know what the deal was. Three years? One year? I don't know the specifics of yeah. the deal. Probably three or five, I would guess. Right. But, uh, yeah, what else did you want to know about it, Russ? Like, thoughts, how, thoughts on it? Yeah. I mean, it's cool. If you make a $20,000 movie that gets in a competition at South by, you're golden. But if you made a $500,000 movie, you're, you're suddenly, you I would, know, taking I would, yourself. I would say the number of $20,000 movies in competition at South by is slim to none now. Like, maybe. Yeah, it's not what it used to be. Ten years ago, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, no, no, I'm just, I'm just thinking out loud. Like, I wonder if the festivals get a cut of that. I know it's very interesting because festivals are supposedly, you know, tastemakers and, you know, arbiters of fashion and all of this sort of stuff. But having been a festival programmer for 10 years, um, and I think most festival programmers and curators will say this, like, you know, you know, sort of woefully not only underpaid, but like having to struggle for everything. And now you have sort of these giants come in and say, well, we're just going to take that content that you've carefully, like, thought about, or maybe not, and and just kind of buy it outright, but not sort of in a way recognize or pay back the festival. You want to cut. Something to think about, yeah. Does, does anybody <laughs> know, uh, uh, is friends with anyone who took this deal? I'm, I'm not. Oh, You're not. I, I, I wonder if anyone it countered like it Willy with a Wonka. bigger number. It's like a, it's like <laughs> Wait, a somebody last knows? ring. Yeah. Oh, Mike, yeah. You took it. Okay. How did that work out for you? How did that work out for you? How's that working out for you? <laughs> Approach the microphone. <laughs> was it did, what, was it a profitable move or was it just? No, there's nothing profitable about it. It's yeah. a it's 125,000. 125,000. And everybody this was for got it at South this was for by. South by. Yeah, but then you, they require a 10 city distribution, which that you then have you to have to pay yourself. usually 75,000. So they require it. Yeah, most most so basically require, there's if you no get money that involved. Much, well, there's you take seven, that the money difference and you between 75 and 125. So, but at any rate, and, it's, and there's nothing good about it. There's nothing good about any of this. Uh, and then the worst thing about it is that now that's the bar. So for those types of dramas, like Meyer Dardell that's here, we were offered 125 with Lena Olin and Rosanna Arquette and Jordan so, Javaris. So why so did you now take it, it then? We didn't. We went, Samuel Goldwyn upped it. Oh. So in the end, we went with Samuel Goldwyn. But it sets the bar in terms of the value system. Could, That's what's bad about it. But yeah. could I, just as a counterpoint, I agree it's bad. I agree it's bad, and I think it's like it's tied to this idea of like self-publishing in some weird way, and Amazon's idea of self-publishing. But it's but the only good thing I have to say is like the only good thing is that I have had films at festivals, good you know, uh, films at Sundance that have gotten like fifty thousand dollar offers. And so at least if you're raising the bar from 50,000, that's a little I mean, that's ten, a little 10 bit years better. ago, those offers were 15,000. Yeah, like so. it, at least we're done with the no MG deals. Yeah. Although I agree, that's like, that's a pretty like low yeah. bar. I, the, I, wor I, the worst part of all of it in terms of the mega corp two mega corporations taking over everything is that these special films won't get seen because they get lost in the morass of crap. Right. So I don't want to live in a world in which Silvio is not recognized as the best film that should be in every single mall in America. And I don't want to, I don't want to be in that space. So the only answer... Which is playing right now, by the way. The Silvio. only answer is to go to curated sites. Like I yeah. sold a film to Shudder. More people than ever have ever seen my film that's exclusively on Shudder. We need to go to exclusive sites that people know if you're brilliant and smart yeah. enough to appreciate the brilliance of Silvio, you go to this site, not Amazon, not Netflix. Right. And it's well, trending that way, well, so we're, it's probably, uh, you know, that's our future, it seems. Thank <laughs> you. Pan Galactic, please, come on down. Mm -hmm. You've been diligently taking notes. Through, I'm, mm -hmm. I'm looking forward to your questions. Well, I was curious if you guys have had any experience or opinions on, like, the aggregation companies like Distriber. Like what? Distriber, I think is Distriber? How? Yeah, I think I don't know. I'm not familiar with Distriber. I, I haven't worked with them. Distrify, you mean? Maybe not. No. Maybe. I think it's just... It's just Distriber. Yeah, that's what I thought. Okay. Yeah, it's called Distriber. It's, it's like an mm -hmm. online company. I think you might... I think what they're doing is they basically take a group of films, like 10 films, and sell them as a block uh, to Netflix to kind of negotiate. Right, because uh, not everybody can enter that thing. Yeah, and you pay them like That's a, a video game thousand. model. Yeah. Video yeah. games were doing that on Steam, and they oh, sort they, of piggybacked on that model, yeah. Gotcha. There was another Brady company out of did this okay. with, at Factory 25 with That was Fantor. supposed to be this panel. Where yeah. is he? He was supposed to be in the ah. audience asking hard-hitting questions. Was, I guess he left. Yeah. But Grady, Grady I mean, did that, too? With yeah. 
No. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I, the the aggregate thing, it, it does come back, and it's kind of like what Mike was saying, like, you know, if 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 you want to play, if you want to pay to play, and if you want to kind of play that space, good luck. I mean, really, I really am like, you know, good luck to you. Um, and again, it's going to depend on the kind of film, but if you have that control and that power and you're working on films with people that, that really think of themselves in a sort of canon, then it, it's incumbent upon you to, like, seek out these sites, whether it's Shutter you know, movie. I mean, I, I can't even keep up on them, and I should. Um, I mean, the documentary that, that I produced, um, it's called Dawson City Frozen Time, and that's the one I was referring to, and it was sold to TCM, but TCM also then sold it to, or the distributor sold it to Filmstruck and Criterion. So it's this whole other level of film and filmmakers, and I made sure that I put it into the TCM festival, so now like half the people at these audiences are like TCM fans who are crazy and rabid and I, I just feel like it's like when you go to make your film you think what you know what's what are the components of the film and who is my audience and you kind of have to do that the same way if it's going to go out into the ether I really feel like you have to be as cognizant and and aware of all that kind of stuff so I don't know anyone else well to, to comment oh. just a little further on that model, Mr. Pan Galactic. Uh, the video is, game oh, industry cool. saw a lot of success with that uh, using Steam. Using Steam, which is, uh, I mean, I think is what, what would make that more successful is if we could get somehow the audience that already uses this. I don't know if you know what Steam is. It's a distribution platform for video games, and it's the largest distribution platform on earth. They have hundreds of millions of subscribers. So they would put out, they, they were called humble bundles, where it would be a bundle of four or five video games, and uh, the user would pay $12 for the bundle, uh, even if they were only interested in one game in that bundle. So it distributed that, that revenue across all of the games. But even if a tiny percent of people even if one million people downloaded that, that was like less than 1% of their entire subscriber base. So it made sense in a model like that. I think if Distriber somehow was able to market films in the same way that uh, Steam is able to market video games or even partner with a company who already has a subscriber base that huge, I think that that model, yeah, is kind of a no-brainer. You know, if you package, but then, but then you're kind of screwing the one film that's bringing everyone else in. I mean, it's just sort of more of a communist idea, of of spreading the wealth because you and your friends. It'd be good for a company that invested in five films, maybe to I don't know. We could talk about it later. <laughs> Is that Any it? more questions? Are we? I'm, I'm curious. Are we also including like Vimeo and YouTube in all of this conversation? Because we haven't even like. I think we could do whatever we want. Oh. It's our panel, yeah. right? Yeah. Yeah. Do we want? Do we want to touch on those? I mean, it, it's something. It's funny because again, it comes down to like Somebody who approaches yes. f filmmakers, and and I know Vimeo was doing this big push for a while, and and uh, I was surprised to see there was some uh, Brazilian documentary team that had a film on Marina Abramovich, and that ended up being exclusive Vimeo content, and I thought Vimeo like. Or, I think or even VHX they, now. They bought VHX, which had a lot of success. Yeah, when began but the movie. their whole like internal development team got fired, so they're not doing that anymore. There you go. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah. Interesting. Yeah, See? I think they've moved away from that, yeah. yeah. The minute it didn't return some exactly. money. Exactly, yeah. Yeah. Hmm. yeah, interesting. Well, How many filmmakers are in this audience? I'm just curious. Raise your hand if you're a filmmaker. All right. Yeah, step up to the mic. So I was thinking that maybe if you have uh, multiple films, would it be, I'm thinking of the, um, the music model where you're, you're playing in a band and you want to play as many venues, as many cities as possible. Would it be a good idea to possibly do that with several different films and several different of these um, online platforms, Vimeo, YouTube, and just spread your spread the message out, spread the word out, and, and is that, or is that a waste of time? And just should you should you focus on one or two, and just try getting your audience that way? I personally feel like it's a waste of time to spread it everywhere. I mean, it's going to be hard enough to drive people to one site, so confusing the matter by driving them to a bunch of different sites is. 
I mean, but then there's the you know, then there's people who are uh, not going to go to the other side. Yeah, I guess that's a tough question. What do you guys think? Well, I, I just realized we're being extremely sort of. Um, uh, what is it? What is? What, are we xenophobic these days? I mean, we're we very concentrated on U.S. and North America, but I'm I'm really curious about the world because, for instance, um, I don't know about your experience, but a lot of times, um, if you don't have a sales agent to kind of do your world sales, you end up kind of selling the world yourself as a producer. And so it's interesting in these different territories, like, you know, I've had films at, at major festivals in different countries, but then I have to contend with wanting the film seen beyond those festivals. And so oftentimes I'm getting sort of approached by these smaller streaming sites. And I think, well, I'd like to do that site, but I'd also like to do you know, another three. I mean, I, I don't know. I almost feel like sometimes if it's non-exclusive, you can do as many as possible to sort of spread the wealth. But that's in, again, that's in multi-territories. If, the, if they're all paying you. Well, they're all going to either pay you a, a, an MG or that you're going to see some sort of return. Not a dollar forty-seven. I got a check <laughs> for 14 cents once. Yes. Mm -hmm. Residual <laughs> check. Yeah. <laughs> On that note, <laughs> <laughs> on that. I think, yeah, we're getting yanked. The most pessimistic panel of the day. <laughs> no, thank you guys for coming and joining us today for this panel. So let's give them a round of applause.